when you look at the Buddhist teachings on dependent co-arising, it's very easy to start wandering down the little byways, getting tied up in some of the complexities. And to miss some of the really blatant things that are right in front of you as soon as you look at the list of factors. And one of them is that the causes of suffering come prior to sensory contact. In other words, it's not the case that suffering arises just because we have bad sights and smells and sounds and tastes and tactile sensations and ideas. It comes from the way we approach our senses, the way we look, the way we listen, the way we smell and taste things, touch things, think about things. And that's a very important lesson right there, to realize the problem is not out there, it's the way we go out there, looking for trouble, basically. Essentially, of course, the mind is looking for food, it's looking for things to feed on. But it tends to feed on all the wrong things. And no wonder it's sick. It goes out looking for things to lust over, looking for things to get angry about, looking for things to be deluded about. And it finds plenty of things out there. If I compare it to a sick person who likes to eat precisely the food that makes his illness worse. And so we've got to get some control over the mind in the way it looks and listens. Otherwise it's very difficult to settle down and meditate, because if you've been going out looking for things to lust about or get angry about in the course of the day, that habit will stick with you. You close your eyes. There's no one here monitoring what you're thinking, and so you can think about anything. And part of the mind is tempted to do just that, pick up the thread of its old defilements. So we need to get some control over the mind. The common image in the canon and in every teacher you hear from after the canon is you've got to get a leash on the mind. One of the most vivid suttas is the one where the Buddha talks about putting six different kinds of animals on leashes and then tying the ends of the leashes together. And they're all going to go off feeding at different places. The crocodile wants to go down and feed in the river. The monkey wants to go up and feed in the tree. The hyena wants to go and feed in the charnel ground. And so they all pull in their different directions, and whichever animal happens to be the strongest, that's why they all get dragged. The solution to this problem is to get a firm stake and tie all the leashes to that firm stake so that no matter which direction the animals pull, they don't pull the other ones. In fact, they can't really get to where they want to feed, and then they'll settle down right next to the stake. The stake here, the Buddha says, is mindfulness of the body. This can function in two ways. One is the reflection we had just now in the different parts of the body. This works two ways. First you start thinking about your own body. This is what you've got in your body. Peel the skin off, put the skin to one side, and look at all the other things you've got. And either side looks especially good. That little pile of skin is certainly not appealing, and the things that were covered up by the skin are not appealing at all. And yet when we put them together, why is it that we can find this so attractive? You can obsess about this, fantasize about this for hours on end. But what's there? You realize it's all a trick of perception. It's all the mind wants something to lust over, and so when it looks at the body, it will see only certain things and allow itself to think about only certain things. And a lot of things have to get obscured. So basically the mind is lying to itself so that it can generate some more lust. That's what it's all about. 
The same thing with anger. The people you're angry at have some good to them. At the moment of anger, you don't want to think about that at all. You'd rather think about whatever is going to stir up your anger. And so what are you doing? You're setting fires in your own mind. You're feeding on precisely the food that's going to make you sick, or take your current illness and make it worse. So as you begin to look at things in this way, you begin to see that it's not really worth it. That wherever you go, you're going to find things that really not have no substance, no value to them at all, and yet you can devote your whole life to trying to get these things. And then what have you got? You've got nothing. All that effort, much of it unskillful, piling up lots of bad karma for very fleeting sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Is it worth it? And so analyzing the body into its different elements, into its different parts is a very good way of counteracting a lot of the unskillful motivation we have for flowing out, looking for sights and sounds and smells and tastes to feed on. That's one way in which mindfulness of the body is a good post for holding you back. The other is if you can develop a sense of well-being with the breath. You don't feel so starved. I mean, the reason the mind goes rushing out to feed on these things is that it's hungry. So you focus instead on the breath, trying to develop a sense of ease, well-being, fullness with the breath. Whether it's the in and out breath or the general spread of breath energy throughout the body, whatever you find most attractive and most gratifying at this moment, focus there. Some people find that the, the order of steps in a John Lee's seven steps doesn't quite work for them. Rather than focus on the in and out breath, they'd like to focus on the breath energy in the body first, which is perfectly fine. It gives you a larger frame of reference, and then in the midst of that breath energy, you notice how the in and out breathing has an impact on the different aspects of breath energy through the body. Whatever you find works so that it feels really good to be here, really gratifying, really satisfying with a sense of fullness that you can feed on. As the Buddha says, we feed on rapture like the radiant gods. The rapture may be too strong a word for what you might feel right now. There may be simply a feeling of refreshment, fullness. But that counts as bitti as well. That counts as rapture as well. For whatever you find gives the mind a sense of satisfaction, well-being here in the present moment. Stick with that. And when the temptation comes to go feeding on other things, you can ask yourself, why go? In fact, you can actually watch a thought head out towards something. But if you've got a sense of well-being here, if it feels really solid, instead of following your old habit, which was to run along with the thought, jump into the thought and go sliding with it, like people in lujas. You can watch it go, and you realize, boy, that's dangerous, going down that iced slope. And that way you can step back from these thought worlds. You have a good place to stay, so you're not running out, engaging in your old feeding habits. Because you're not so hungry. You've got a good source of food inside. And so when there is the impulse to go out and feed on things that are unhealthy, you can step back and look at it for what it is. You no longer feel the compulsion, the need, the drive to get your kicks the way you used to. Then you can see the process, how the mind will focus on certain details and ignore lots of other details just so that it can inflame itself. You see that the whole process came from within, came from that ignorance. You weren't really paying attention to the issue of stress. You were just noticing, that's what I want, I'm going to go with it. When you're sensitive to the breath, though, you can begin to sense how oppressive a feeling of lust is, how oppressive a feeling of anger is. 
all the other unskillful states. They do things to the breath energy in your body. And so you become more and more sensitive to the damage that these outflows do, these effluents. To learn how to use the body as that firm post. So when the impulse comes to go feeding in the river or go feeding in the charnel ground, comes up, you have a way of reining the mind in. A little thought may go running out in that direction, but if you don't go running with it, it can't go very far. And you begin to see how that impulse to feed in unhealthy ways accomplishes nothing at all. It creates a lot of needless suffering. And doesn't the world have enough pointless suffering already? Try to develop a sense of nibbida, disenchantment, disgust, revulsion, whatever the way you want to translate the term. But that sense of you don't want to eat that stuff anymore. You don't want to feed that way anymore. You've got something better. Why create more pointless suffering? It's in this way that you can begin to exercise some restraint over the mind. The ability to stay mindful of the breath helps you with sense restraint, and the sense restraint, of course, helps when the time comes to sit down and engage in more formal meditation. You've been keeping the mind under control, not tight, unpleasant control, but skillful control in the course of the day, feeding it well in the course of the day. It's a lot easier to feed it properly now as you're meditating. The mind stays firmly with its one object. You've kept it on a short leash for the day. You don't have to engage in all the difficulties that come from having, say, your dog on a long leash. That can, it can wind around all kinds of things. If it's been on a long leash all day, you have to unwind it from telephone poles and bushes and trees and park benches and who knows what. Or if it made its way to the charnel ground, you've got to pull it back from that. Sometimes it carries horrible things in its jaws as it comes back. But hey, you've kept it on a short leash throughout the day. As soon as anything was going to go rushing out for food, you've you stay back. The thought may go out, but you stay back. And some of the time comes to meditate, you're right here. 